Oh, yeah, I was supposed to think of a joke to start this episode off with. Usually. Oh, boy. Um, You would take a second? No, I think I've put in the same amount of effort as the writers of Pink Lady and Jeff. Welcome to Bottle Episodes. Welcome to Bottle Episodes. (laughs) Welcome to Pink Lady. Starring Jeff Altman and B and K. With guest stars Blondie, Sherman Hemsley, and Bert Park. And now, here he is, Jeff Altman. Welcome to Bottle Episodes. I'm David Piccolomini. I'm, I'm Daniel Crow. Boom. And this week, uh, we're going solo as we watched pink lady and jeff we're not going solo we're going as a duo in tribute to pink lady <laughs> one of us is pink lady and one of us is jeff no one of us is me and one is k okay we can be okay we can be both of the pink ladies i want to be k okay i don't know which one's which k was the better one which she she had the mean comments oh <laughs> by the way the better one is such a very rough way to- i mean she was she was the she had the better lines. She did have the better lines. And although, okay, let's explain what the show. Oh, well, here, let's explain what the podcast is. This is Bottle Episodes. We watch the pilot of a top rated or a poorly rated show on IMDb. And then we watch the pilot and uh, the top rated episode to see if it gets any better. And today we have a pretty infamous show. Yeah. Often considered one of the worst ever made. Absolutely. Pink Lady and Jeff from 1980. Now, the name, apparently when it aired, it was just Pink Lady. Yep. And they added and Jeff on DVD releases. Because I, 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 we watched the episode and I saw Pink Lady, but I kept referring, seeing it referred to as Pink Lady and Jeff. And I looked up why it had that name, and I was shocked to find out it was ever released on DVD. Yeah, that is a weird, why would you put this on DVD? Yeah, I'd even that didn't even phase me, because I was just like, that's the phrase we use. Yeah. But like, this should have been on Laserdisc disc Max. I guess Jeff Altman might still have some fans. He might, he might have sold this at his gigs. <laughs> That's why it had to say and Jeff. He yeah. got that mm-hmm. added so he could sell it as merch. Out of his trunk <laughs> when he performs at uh, improvs in strip malls across the country. Hey, the dream, I think, is yeah, what you're talking I about. I mean, he was, he was a successful comic. He, on yeah. his Wikipedia, it says he appeared on Letterman 45 times. Wow. Yeah. Jeff Altman. The Jeff Altman. Uh, so the show, uh, so is it me and Kai? Is that? Yeah. Okay. So me it's definitely me because I kept waiting for them to do a who's on first thing with her name and they never did. Well, we only watched two of the episodes. That's true. It could have been, they could have gotten who's on first did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they could have abdicated everyone's Costello. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, me and Kai, they are, uh, two Japanese singers who had one hit over here. Barely a hit. Barely it hit a number hit. 37. Wow. But it was just a novelty disco. Well, I think they expected them to be way bigger than they ended up being because they were huge in Japan. Oh, okay. So they were huge in Japan. And then they had an anime made about them. What? According to their Wikipedia. Yeah. They had an anime made about them. And in 2014, a tribute group was launched to them, which included 14 members, <laughs> which is too many for a do. Du- Imagine if you went to go see a tribute to Hall and Oates and there were 14 guys on stage <laughs> singing rich girl. You'd be like, this is too much, man. Are they doing it as like a choir? Or they I like- don't, I don't know, man. I, I just saw it on Wikipedia that they have a, 14 person tribute group that is yeah um, that's so many pink ladies yeah did you think one of them plays jeff oh that'd be great because it looked to be all japanese women and if there was one of them pretending to be jeff that's comedy <laughs> that would be great i actually I, w- I had this thought about like cultural appropriation recently is that like i think part of the reason that america doesn't see it as so bad is because we love it when other people do that to us like, whenever someone's, like, doing, like, ni hao, I'm a cowboy, you're like, yeah, I love that. I don't know. I, I saw a bunch of Germans dressed as cowboys on a plane, and it really did upset me. It did it really? I was like, that's not, you can't do that. That's our thing. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't respectful of cowboys. I'm not respectful of cowboys. I mean, I'm more respectful than these Germans are. Are you sure? <laughs> I think I... I When's the a- last time you wore a cowboy hat and boots? Listen up. Uh, I've 
I've spent my whole life saving horses and riding cowboys. <laughs> I'm very respectful of them. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Pink Lady. So yeah, they were a real duo. But they didn't really speak English. They didn't speak English at all. They had to learn all their lines phonetically. Yeah, so they're just like repeating them. and then in order- Which was exhausting for them because they were also huge in japan and still touring japan they were touring japan as they did this show they would come back to film the show go back to japan to tour all week be very popular over there play stadiums they would get the scripts and have to memorize them phonetically because they didn't speak english yeah so they were just given- not it's not fair to them no <laughs> yeah <laughs> although i guess what were they gonna do be like okay come back in three years when you're ready or just don't make them do sketches well, and let them sing their Japanese songs. That is uh, one of the things that I did notice is uh, in between the two episodes, they are in markedly less of the show. Yeah, they are. It's really the Jeff Altman show. Here's Jeff one thing: Altman I, Variety I've, Hour. So yeah, Jeff does the bulk of the comedy in the first episode. Yes, and it opens up with a monologue that's like, probably like ten minutes, and every joke is, "I'm Jeff Altman. You've never heard of me." <laughs> All of his jokes are, I'm not famous. Yeah. And I thought, as I was watching, I'm like, all right, these aren't funny, but you know what? Good self-deprecation from Jeff. I get this is what you would do in this scenario when you've got a big network TV show and it's your first thing. And then the credits roll, and Jeff is not a writer. <laughs> He's not a writer on this show. There were just five dudes in a room being like, ha ha, Jeff's not famous. And then he had to go out there and deliver these lines. That's why he seems so unenthusiastic about them. Although I was will... a comic. He writes his own jokes. I think he did wasn't he was creative he was a creative consultant. Yeah, he does have a credit for consultant. But that's usually what they'll do if you're not like a writer, if you're not in the writer's room all the time, you're yeah. a creative consultant. But also like he probably didn't have a lot of power. It was his first show. The guys yeah. that created it had power they created uh hr puffin stuff <laughs> they had hits under their belt sorry i know i know that's true but it's just it's such a funny sentence of like no you have to bow to me the creator of hr puffin stuff it was popular i'm not saying it wasn't popular I, that's the other thing like their background to try to do this show which is for adults is hampered by the fact that they made shows for kids who have a much lower expectation <laughs> so like that hr puffin stuff is able to be successful just because wow look at the look at the big puppets i'm four i like this but yeah that's true compared to and now adults are expecting jokes and insightful uh, japanese ladies in a hot tub that is true every episode ends with them getting in a hot tub per the request of a producer who just i assume made the show because he had the hots for these two yeah there is a level of like there's there's a weird thing where you're like, oh, you're going to make the two Japanese women trip down to a bikini every show. And you, you can tell even through the language barrier that they hate this. <laughs> there's disdain in their voice when they're explaining that it's a big Japanese custom to get in a hot tub at the end of every television show. And you can tell they don't they might not know the words, but they know it sucks. <laughs> they're like they know at the end of the day they still have to just get in a hot tub at the end of this. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. Jeff is like, oh, I don't want to get in the hot tub. Oh, no, you have to make me. Yeah. Because he's in a suit. Yeah. And they just force him into a hot tub in a suit. I think you guys all get it. Uh, who did come up with it? Art Fisher. Although it doesn't see appear to, like I, I was looking it up earlier, there was no like guy. It's like, a, it was like Sid Croft is the yeah, production the company. Yeah, stuff guy. But they didn't do any like... Uh, they didn't have like there's not like a series creator there's just like a production company well yeah it. this came down from the hand of god <laughs> <laughs> he blessed us with this show self so. i mean you don't really need to credit a creator for doing a variety show like what development do you actually do here the format was so it was done yeah it was just it was just a bunch of writers being like what sketches can you come up with pretty quickly what they said was can you do sunny and share but can you swap out sunny and share for pink lady and then they said who's pink lady and they went, don't worry, they'll blow up. And then they didn't. And then they were like, who's Jeff Altman? And, then, and they went, you've hit gold. Keep, <laughs> keep asking who Jeff Altman is. That's funny. Uh, so then, um, yeah, so the show, it's like a 10 minute monologue or not monologue. It's a scene, I guess. Yeah. But it's not like it's, it's very clear that they're just reading. 
phonetically. Yeah. Like, so they don't have any sense of timing with any of it or anything like that. And apparently the writers could not edit the scripts. Oh, yeah. Well, you can't because they learned it phonetically. Yeah. So they couldn't edit the scripts of Pink Lady because they're learning phonetically and they couldn't edit the scripts of anyone else because Pink Lady needed to know when to jump in. Oh, I didn't even think about that. So they, yeah, because they were listening for when they would have to go in. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So they don't know. So you can't change anything. So once you write it, mm-hmm. it's just done. Yeah. And it turns out that's a lot of first draft jokes. And I just want to say that Pink Lady, you know, they're definitely better at English than I am at Japanese. I don't hold their lack of English skills against them, but it's ill advised to have them lead a variety show. I was going to say, you know, Daniel, I would hold your lack of Japanese uh, skills more against you if you were hosting a television show in Japan. I, I, okay. I, th- I could see how it would work. Not just, it doesn't have to be me. But I could see you could get like an American that doesn't speak Japanese on it, because a lot of the Japanese game shows are wacky. Right. Like if all of the joke is just the, one guy going, I don't know, and then they all make fun of him. As long as you're, you know, confident enough in yourself to know that you're going to be the butt of every joke, and then they pull your pants down and everyone laughs, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. That works. Yeah, yeah, I guess. But yeah, you're right. We weren't doing that really with. That's a very different game show if we're pulling Japanese women's pants down. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a that's a weird. That's not a game. That's a live leak compilation. Yeah, that is. But so there's obviously going against it is the fact that the writing has to be first draft on everything. Yep. Your stars can't deliver lines because they're memorizing it. Mm-hmm. They yeah. can't deliver lines, but also. This show is fully invested in disco about a year after disco has died. Yeah, it is a very, and that's the funny thing is like when I was watching this, I was like, it just feels like a 70s variety show, Mm -hmm. but it is taking place in 1980, the day after disco died. Yeah, we're fully a year later. And everybody hates disco. Yes. I don't know that much about the death of disco. Well, shockingly, it wasn't because of this show. Okay, this show was, uh, this was like a faint afterthought of it. Yeah, I think when it just went into development and the executives weren't really paying attention, but like also in 1980, you're going to have stuff like the village people had a film and production the year before, and when it came out, it cost like five times as much as Star Wars to make the village people movie. Can't stop the music. And when it comes out a year later, it makes like $3. Really? They just create the uh, Razzies in response to that film. Wow. That, so that's yeah. the death of disco created the Razzies. Mm-hmm. Um, but so the thing about the of disco dying out was you hear a lot of people today go, it was unfair that disco died out. A lot of people chalk it up to, oh, everyone was pretty racist or homophobic because you know so many of the early disco artists were gay or people of color and i think they're arguing in bad faith to a degree because the fact of the matter is all those good disco songs you're thinking of are a tiny 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 slice of what actually was disco (laughs) you go back and you look at the charts and stuff like disco duck is hitting number one which is just about it's about a donald duck type sounding character that likes disco that's the whole song. Or like a disco medley of the Star Wars theme. Oh, man. those up there for weeks. Hey, a fifth of Beethoven's pretty good. No, it's not. I mean, really think about that. It's not. It's a disco. Be- so people are completely overloaded with this genre that's taking over everything for the last eight years. Of course, there's a backlash. All your favorite bands or artists are turning to disco because it's the only marketable thing. But it's not like there's not still a market for other genres. People want to hear that stuff, so the backlash is pretty swift, and it's just seen as corny overnight, but also, it intersects perfectly, and this is why I think people are kind of arguing in bad faith when they say that the backlash to disco was entirely like racist or homophobic, because at the same time that disco dies out, you have three genres coming out that are we're still living in the reverberations of. Uh-huh. Uh, you have... You have hip hop, punk rock, and electronic all coming out at this pretty much the same time. Famously into their own straight white male genres. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm, I'm, they I, all, right. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my point. <laughs> like, I, yeah, electronic yeah. music is all like young kids, club scene. Like, uh, well, at the time it would have been, you know, crap. I, I'm craft here work. for a craft work mention, <laughs> but the, you know, that wasn't, yeah, craft work are straight white guys, but there's also like Yellow Magic Orchestra, which is Japanese guys. Wendy Carlos is trans. Like, there's great, right, yeah. 
and then later, you know, a few years later after this, you'll get the guys in Detroit starting techno and all of that. Uh, Hip hop obviously is uh, you know heavily yeah, black. <laughs> um punk rock though like you probably think oh yeah there's a lot of white dudes but like you look at the start like darby crash and the germs he's gay x-ray specs their lead well, singer is a black woman there's most like, of these- punk rock i mean there's like there's it seems like punk rock really splits into like racist punk rock and anti-racist punk rock oh, okay yeah the, like the like skinheads are a very small yeah. unpopular part of the group but well, there's um, like angry there's like it's like angry against people or like angry on behalf of people yeah so like those genres are all coming into their own at the same time and people are like oh yeah I think disco actually does suck. And like the the stuff that people do like they still continue to have careers afterwards because they were actually good music. Like the guys from ABBA are still writing hit songs into the 80s. They're just not disco songs. The Bee Gees are still writing hit like Islands in the Stream is from the B- they wrote that. <laughs> Giorgio Moroder is still a huge producer throughout the 80s and all of that. <clears throat> I like but, that we've just we've we've stumbled into your special interest. <laughs> well, the the thing is, like, it is entirely relevant to this show. Yeah. So they are so numerous reasons why it's just sort of fallen apart as a popular thing. I think the main thing is there were now better options available that for, I would, that could kind of hit the core to any number of people. It reached a critical mass. I wish this had like if this had hit. A little bit harder and then they had to pivot to a different genre <laughs> well i th- i think the one thing is they might have been looking at it be like oh no the reports of disco's death were greatly exaggerated because there was that one little dead cat bounce when funky town was a hit in 1980 so they're like we're back baby and then they released pink lady and jeff like we're not back at all no turns we out we are not back put it back in the production because it's just like pink lady are doing disco covers of hit song do you want to hear a disco cover of don't stop by fleetwood mac sung by two japanese women that don't know what they're saying you're in luck because that this show has that <laughs> there's no audience for that in 1980 yeah there's i mean zero. i guess i guess they assumed it would just be like suburban people like people bored at home watching it the same way like but it but the backlash to disco because like other things have had backlashes where like you're not really seeing like you know like rock even at a certain point is like do it like i will even say like at the same time there's a backlash against disco like progressive rock has a big backlash against it commercially as well and it kind of dies out at the same time there was just like a big sea change in music at that time so um and this show gets stuck in it, as it is a musical variety show. Uh, yeah, and so they got uh in the first episode they got uh Blondie, yeah, Sherman Hensley, uh, Sherman Helmsley, Helmsley, which, which is very difficult for the Pink Ladies to say. They're struggling to say Sherman Helmsley, Hemsley, Hemsley. Uh, Sherman, I'm Hem- struggling to say it. <laughs> Forgive me, <laughs> Sherman Hemsley. Uh, who uh Sanford and Sons. Yeah. Yes, and uh Bert Parks. Who I didn't recognize. They said he hosted Miss America or whatever. Uh oh, yeah. Jeff refers to him as an American icon. <laughs> We're like, if you say so, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then they just kind of do sketch. Skits. Yeah, they're not particularly funny skits. We get to see Jeff do his Johnny Carson impression. He has to go back to it <laughs> as many times as he can. Well, he does it in the other episode we watched as well. Yeah. Oh, he had like a whole TV series. Burt Park had a whole series, and Burke's Law. No, he's what? Not. No, that's not him. Okay, I, I, sorry, I got Burt and Burke confused. <laughs> Burt and Burke. Now that's a show. Ah, uh, it's a real Mork and Mindy situation. Yeah. Uh, okay, so they go to. So it's yeah, it's just a bunch of like. It is funny when they have uh, Sherman Hemsley there. You're just like, what? Like, what is the game? Like, they get stars. Yeah. They get like big names. Jerry Lewis is in the other episode. We yeah. Watched. Uh, so uh, they do a bunch of Hollywood themed skits for like ten minutes. Yeah, they just keep going like pop 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 Hollywood. There's one sketch that you commented has a little potential. Which one was in that? In the Hollywood bit, where a group comes to audition. Oh yeah. As like, a, like a group of Route. standby. Yeah. A bystander. Sorry. They're together. It, yeah, they're auditioning they have a as a group. Yeah, I like. It doesn't that. quite work, but you can see where it would have worked. 
there's something very funny in the idea of auditioning like large groups of people as yeah. like an, like an audience that go I would like to see that group travel from place to place. Yeah. Do they travel as a crowd? I mean, we go? see them walk into the scene as a crowd. Um, so, yeah, I want to see them just have to go to multiple auditions in a day. Yeah. <laughs> Half of them make it on the subway. Gosh, yeah. So that's the highlight, maybe. Actually, the highlight is Blondie's performance. Yeah. Doing it, a B-side. It is weird. Blondie has, like, numerous hit songs coming out that year, and they don't play any of them on this show. <laughs> They're saving it for Letterman. Probably, yeah. And so she did Shayla. You know that Blondie classic. Yep, we all we all are humming it right now in our head. On an album with multiple number ones on it, they play. That they're actively promoting. <laughs> they just play that. Uh, Yeah. And, and then we get to hear the Pink Ladies sing, Stop in the Name of Love. Oh, yeah. That's, um, you know, not their, not their best moment. None of their songs are their best moment. Oh, yeah, they, they did start off the episode a little bit with, uh, now they're going to do a traditional Japanese greeting, and then yeah. they just did Boogie Wonderland. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if Disco hadn't already died, it was like they were trying to kill him. <laughs> this actually was, it was just one horny producer trying to, like, yeah. kill Disco, actually killing Disco with his hubris. The other thing is, like, there were a million TV shows just like this that have been forgotten by time, where they were doing corny Disco things throughout. Yeah, and they just kept working, and this just this show had the bad fortune of being outside of that time. Yeah, it, essentially, like Sunny and Cher, like yeah. yeah, those like this is essentially they were just doing disco sketches and Cordy mm-hmm. stuff like that. The thing is, they don't need they should have pivoted, but he keep he keeps saying throughout the show that like this is a disco show. What are you doing? But that's what they could do, though. And then how do you pivot that? They're, they're competent singers. They have good voices. They can pivot to doing something that's not disco. Yeah, Blondie's right there. Blondie's right there. New Wave is popular right now. Have them do New Wave songs. Are, what are you doing? No, I think I think you go to rap. I think they learn all the words phonetically. <laughs> that would be tough for them. We Here to sing Planet Rock as made famous by Africa Bambata. It's Pink Lady. <laughs> <laughs> they get de la soul <laughs> <laughs> well before they formed <laughs> yeah they just get children de la soul okay <laughs> uh nwa as like teenage oh no i would want yeah this should have been rebooted at the end of the 80s <laughs> pink lady's back and she's pissed <laughs> pink ladies are a variety of apple right <laughs> yes is that what they're named after i, I guess or something lost in translation here you, th- you think that's the issue? <laughs> you think it's the issue that it's we're lost in translation? I, I wish this had been lost in translation, by the way. <laughs> it is funny because I kept trying to look it up earlier and it was hard to find because uh, it just kept wanting to send me to like Greece because there's a new show called Rise of the Pink Ladies. Not about this at all. Oh, oh, when you said it kept wanting to send you to Greece, I was like, the country? <laughs> You just search <laughs> Pink Lady TV show and like, do you want to buy some tickets to Athens? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you, all the ladies over there, perfectly pink. Pink ladies. Get all the apples you need in Greece. Uh, yeah, let me look up to see if they... That actually is an interesting point because the film Greece would have come out a couple, like two years before this and it would have been huge and the Pink Ladies were characters in that. It is possible that they made this show thinking people will tune in thinking it's about Greece. They may have cynically done that. Well, no, but they had that from 1976. This was in development starting in 76? No, but their names, they were the Pink Ladies. Weren't yeah, they? no, no, no. I know. I'm saying the TV producers would have cynically. Oh, picked Pink Lady? To do the show because they were trying to get the Greece audience. Oh, oh so it's after a cocktail. Oh, okay. So, their yeah. name, yeah. Sorry. I know. I'm fine. It doesn't really affect my day to day. I went. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> just you driving tomorrow. Just stupid. no, no. I wanted them to be named after the apples. <laughs> you don't even like apples. I do like apples. It's one of the few fruits I do like. <laughs> How do you like them apples? You're like, yes, yes, appropriately. Apples, oranges, pomegranates. I go for. That's it. I do like pineapple, but I'm allergic. It gives me a rash. Okay. What right, if- right into bottle episodes. Tell us what fruit gives you a rash. 
<laughs> I hope that's the fan mail we get. <laughs> David, what fruit gives you a rash? Uh none i don't think i was i I don't know actually a pineapple would give me a rash if you like rubbed it on me okay so i shouldn't have been rubbing it on (laughs) yeah that might have been the issue i'm such an idiot (laughs) i'm allergic to pineapple can't believe i was rubbing pineapples all over my torso (laughs) giving me a rash uh wait were the pink ladies in that well they were just named the pink ladies because they wore pink right i feel like they're referred to the referred to as pink ladies in in greece yeah that's what I mean, because they just wore pink. Yeah. They weren't named after the cocktail or the apple. They were named after the band. <laughs> this thing set in the 1950s. They stole it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, they were they were really popular in Japan for a while, and then they got brought over to America and then sent back to Japan. Yep. It's, uh, and then we're pretty successful in Japan for a while. No, oh, yeah. They're, yeah, they still... They're they legends have, there, I guess. They have a tribute act. Yeah. But uh, I'm trying to think of other sketches from this first episode. The guy sang a song. He sang a song? Uh, The one guy, Bert. Oh, uh, yeah. In the Hollywood section. Yeah. At one point, they uh, there's like a crocodile hunter type character, right? Oh, yeah. I don't remember what he's we, he doing. He was searching for like pilots or like. Something like that. Man, it, these. There, we meet the character of Art Nouveau. Oh, yeah. He just sells junk. He comes back in the other episode. He sells. It's like a fake art dealer kind of vibe. Yeah. And they're trying to do like making fun of modern art, essentially. Yeah. But also throughout these sketches, there there is a, a woman that they clearly hired at the last minute when they realized Pink Lady couldn't be in sketches. Yeah. She's good. She's, she's good. She's, she's good very she talented. Um, yeah. Uh, Anna Matthias. Yeah. These sketches are just very forgettable throughout. It, you are just watching, like, like I really, it, it takes a lot for Sherman Hemsley to be this, like, boring. That is, you know what this show feels like? What? It feels like they forgot to do a school project until the night before. <laughs> These all feel slapped together at the last second. Yeah. Every I single would, sketch. I would say so, yeah. It is, I mean, but that's, that's the kind of the problem if you have to, like, if you can't edit. Like writing isn't about getting the joke right on the first try. It's about editing it over time to get it right. But for the first episode, at least you have a lot of time to work on it. That's true. I get that you have to turn out the other ones a little quicker, but it also might be a thing of, uh, because, uh, you have to turn them or because you're just putting them out. Yeah. Like that. There is a level of like, you're just like, oh, well, here it is. Like, they've already memorized these words. We can't adjust anything. We can't. And, like, also, there's no timing. They don't know what they're. They can't do timing. Oh, I remember one of the weird sketches. All right. Sherman wins an Oscar. Yes. And then he's like, I'm sick and tired of people turning this into a political affair. Right. Then a sign language interpreter comes on stage and the crowd loses their mind. Right. And I'm then- not sure what the joke was. And then also because he then just gets political yeah. for like the, the rest of the speech is about weird political stuff, but it's not like regular politics. It's like, it's like this weird, like he's like, and all people with club foot should be allowed to have dental. Like, but also like people find it funny as soon as the interpreter comes out. Right. That seems to be the main joke. And I'm not sure. I think I'm missing something culturally. Yeah, that's also true. We could be missing, like, there might be a thing in 1979 where there was a sign language interpreter. That and went, that was seen as political in some way. Yeah, I guess so. Who knows? I, like, yeah, I don't I don't want to give this show more thought than the writers did. <laughs> well, we already have. Yeah, I mean, that's, no. Like, I didn't look up any of the writers. I bet some of them might have gone on to do some interesting things. Yeah, we can look. Yeah. Oh, well, this works. There's uh so it seems like a lot of the people they all worked on the Bay City Roller show. So they specialize in doing shows in America for acts that were not popular in America for six episodes. <laughs> what kind of range does the Bay City Roller show have? 6.8 on IMDb. Uh, can't do it. Too good of a show. It's too good. The Bay City Rollers. They really They know com- well, they would at least be able to speak English if that, they were doing jokes. That does go a long way for these. Yeah. Also, this clearly looks like a show for children. Yeah, uh, that I think is the problem is they were trying to transition to adult television on when one all of, the writers were like HR Puff and stuff writers, 
Right, with also like two Japanese women yeah. who don't speak English. It's like, why are you doing this on the hardest mode possible? Um. So anyway, a couple other sketches though in this first episode before we move on, just to yeah, yeah. show how crazy it is. Uh, one, the whole joke is it's funny when boxers have brain damage. Yep. Uh, one, he does his Johnny Carson impression, and then Pink Lady are guests on it, and then they bring out a Japanese comedian who doesn't speak English, and everyone is confused. Yeah. Oh, that I forgot about that. Yeah. The, like they did a fake Carson. Yeah. Which was just him interviewing them as fake Carson. His Carson is okay. It is a solid Carson that a lot of people have. Yeah, but it's not like it seems to be a centerpiece. It yeah. shouldn't be his centerpiece. Well, so that was the thing is I think so I was looking up stuff about the show and uh originally it was supposed to be a, a different uh, a female impressionist. Okay. In Jeff Altman's spot. And uh, so I think what happened is they picked uh, this, they picked this, the, like all the sketches and stuff and what they were going to do. And it was probably going to be like a Joan Rivers impression because mm. the other woman, I forget her name. It was something. But a lot of the sketches are not that's like there's one sketch where he, he's they're like, what if women were uh, soldiers and they needed USO shows and he comes out. And he's like a buff boy that they're all cat calling. That's yeah, the whole sketch. It's it's well, it's doing it's making fun of the idea of like what happens if women treated men the way men treat women. Wow, very funny. Thank you. Wow, we Jeff really... uh, in that scene we find out way more chest hair than I expected. <laughs> a lot of chest hair on Jeff. J Dog's got a lot of chest didn't hair. Didn't expect it. He didn't. Yeah, didn't no, he doesn't expect it. He doesn't seem. He seems very well groomed. Yeah. Which is not to say you can't have a lot of chest hair and be well groomed, but a lot of guys. I he, feel like he struck me as a guy that wouldn't want it. Shave his chest. Wax, maybe. Wax. Uh, yeah, it's too early for lasers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they just bring out, they do a fake Tonight Show. It is weird to do a fake Tonight Show because all I'm thinking about is how we could just be watching the Tonight Show. It looked like the real set. They may have just actually filmed on the set. Yeah, why not? It's Same right there. network. Yeah. Well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then the joke of the, cause, so they have one Japanese cast member with them. They actually have two Japanese cast members because there's a guy that plays the comic in that scene, but then there's also the guy that plays their bodyguard who always gets in the hot tub at the end. He's yeah. just like a big sumo guy. Yep, they, that's true. I forgot about Yeah, so that's their bodyguard, the sumo guy. And there's a great part right at the beginning where they try to explain to Jeff that they have a bodyguard and they keep going, bodyguardo. And Jeff goes, what are you? I don't under, I don't speak Japanese. And it's it. You know what it feels like? It feels like in Dora the Explorer when Dora encounters a very obvious problem. She's like, "What am I supposed to do?" And you're supposed to scream, be "Like you got go to the left, Dora. Go to the left." And it's the, bodyguard, and Jeff they, Altman. It's they, bodyguard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how that scene feels. <laughs> uh, by the way, it's bodyguard. Jeff Altman is what I'm trying to describe uh, that movie with <laughs> Whitney Houston in it, with that Whitney Houston song in it. Whitney herself is also in it. Is she in it? Okay, I couldn't remember. Yeah. My brain was now. It's her and Kevin Costner. Okay, Jeff Altman. It's not. It's not in it. It's bodyguard Jeff Altman. Uh, <laughs> That's me trying to tell Jeff. The bodyguard Altman. with Jeff Altman instead of Whitney Houston. Very different movie. <laughs> Everything as he changes tries, as he tries to sing. I will always love you. But beauty remains. Yeah. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to it on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, or tell your friends or whatever. Who yeah, cares? let them know. Let them know. Or who cares? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Dago, what do you want to plug? Um, you can follow me on social media, but I'm only on Japanese social media. <laughs> so find me there, Daniel F. Pro, on whatever your preferred Japanese social media is. I'm still learning Japanese. Donate. So I'm out there making posts that people don't really understand yet, but you should find me on there. Donate the yen to my Patreon. Please, <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, and uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram at DPIC Comedy or Dick Pick Comedy, which is what it's slowly become. You can also find david at any jeff altman show he goes to all of them he's a big I go, fan i'm a big fan i go every weekend i'm at the funny bone whichever one he's at <laughs> and be like, are you the jeff altman <laughs> jeff altman i keep doing jerry lewis impressions at him he uh, whenever this get, whenever this gets plugged into the episode they may not have encountered the jerry lewis part yeah so that's gonna be weird that's spoilers fine. later <laughs> in the episode goodbye goblin comedy special uh but unfortunately nobody knows who jeff altman is so his, I guess David Letterman does. Yeah. They hang his out. Wikipedia page was clearly written by him, by the way. Oh, you think so? Because it, uh, it's like Jeff Altman has appeared on Letterman 45 times, and he has wowed the following. Co- and then lists like very famous comics. And then at the end, it's like, also, he was the biggest inspiration for Judd Apatow. He clearly wrote the page himself. <laughs> 
There is a thing where not a lot of people listen to this podcast, but I do think randomly very successful people have listened to this podcast. Look, I'll say this, Jeff, if you're listening to this podcast, you've done better in comedy than I have. Um, but also no one knows who you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take that, Jeff. <laughs> It's such a funny name to be paired with Pink Lady. I don't know why. You know what it reminds me of? Yeah. It reminds me of those commercials for Liberty Mutual where it's like Limu, Emu, and Doug. <laughs> yeah. What it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was this or like Kevin. You needed yeah. like Pink Ladies and Kev. Pink Lady and Kevin can wait. Now there's a show I'd like to see. Ooh. Kevin James with the Pink Ladies. Yeah. He's, yeah. Got, he's doing a lot of physical comedy. They're loving it. Yeah. Uh, this actually probably should be a physical comedian rather than Jeff Altman. Yeah, he's so like straight laced with them, and you need a wacky guy. And his his jokes are all verbal, but if it was physical comedy, they could play this in Japan. Oh, people would have watched you, Jeff. You could have been huge in Japan, worldwide. Like Mr. Bean's one of the biggest shows worldwide because you don't need to speak any specific language to get it. Oh yeah, you just what is, is it funny that the guy fell down? Fell yeah. down. Yeah, I was like, is that's funny. That's that would have been a good approach. Anyway, we should probably move on to the second episode, the highest rated episode. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Luis Duart was uh, the name of the Luis Duart was the name of the person who was originally supposed to be an. Hi, I'm she... Luis, and I do art. <laughs> That's how she introduces herself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, voice acting is an art. <laughs> uh, okay, so episode five. Yeah. Now. Uh, there's one real big reason why we're we were excited for this fifth episode. Go on, because uh, at the end of the first episode, mm-hmm. he's thanking everybody for doing the show. Oh yes, yes. And then he names the cast. He names the cast, and then we go. Wait, what? Jim yeah. Varney. Yeah, he mentions Jim Varney, and we don't see Jim Varney anywhere in the first episode. For anyone listening who doesn't know who Jim Varney is, he was Ernest in all of the Ernest movies. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Ernest movies, he's Slinky in Toy Story. Yeah. But you'd recognize the voice for yeah. sure. Uh, so Jim Varney is, we were like, wait, he's in this? And then we re-went through all the sketches of the first episode. You cannot find Jim Varney anywhere. We're like, I guess a young Jim Varney just looks like Jeff Altman. And then the first sketch in episode five, we're like, oh, there's Jim. That's so I what... guess Jim Varney must have just been in that crowd sketch. And we yeah. don't see him. He was just, he was going to be a more featured player. Yeah. And I'll say this. Uh, Jim lights up the screen. He's, he really does. He's delightful. He's more of he's so much more of an actor than Jeff is. Jeff is a comic, not an actor. That's not to say you can't be a good actor if you're a comic, but they are different skill sets and you need to have both to be good at them. Yeah, and Jim Varney is like such a I mean, have you ever seen the videos of him doing like Shakespeare and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he's a legit actor. Yeah. It is funny we know him for like Ernest, but like, Yeah. Um but I'm mean, that's not to say the sketches that he's in are good, but he's making the best of the material that he can it was a delight to watch jim varney on screen he plays abe lincoln in a sketch yeah for like there's like a 10 minute roast of abe lincoln sketch yeah where all of his favorite people come like jefferson davis and 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 i nearly said lee harvey oswald (laughs) time traveling lee harvey oswald um yeah they just roast him yeah pretty aggressively for no reason also mary todd lincoln like Makes fun of him for not being good at yeah. sex. But there's a weird moment where like John Wilkes Booth is doing a lot of jokes that imply that Lincoln is already aware that John Wilkes Booth has murdered him. Yeah. Like all the jokes were like, I'll shoot you. And Lincoln's like, ha 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 ha. That's funny because you will. It does. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot. But uh, Varney, good Lincoln. He, he honestly, when they put it on, I was like, oh, yeah, he could have played Lincoln. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although immediately enjoyed this episode more at the beginning because they just do a japanese song that's like immediately yes. power rangers coded oh they're in great power rangers outfits yeah it rules yeah the first number i was immediately i was like all right i'm back on board for this show yeah and also it's just nice let the let the pink ladies sing in their native tongue you have a show about a japanese duo i don't do they think america was going to get offended if they sang in japanese i think if the first song was in japanese people would have turned it off why are you watching a show about a Japanese singing duo then? Because it's the 80s and it's what's on. Go to one of the other three channels. <laughs> That's what they would do. That's yeah. what I'm saying is I think they were definitely worried about that. You definitely have to have the first song. Well, in it didn't work with them singing English. It got canceled after six episodes. Yeah, but I think that's for disco reasons. 
You can't. Yeah. No, you definitely want them to be able to sing Japanese in the show. But if you do it as the first song on the first episode, people will hear that and go, "I guess they're just going to sing in Japanese." But dude, I don't if they're in that. these really cool Power Rangers outfits, people will have never seen anything like that. That's true. They're that, like, "This is sick." It is. This show should have just. They should have just done a children's show, because that's what everybody. That's kind of what I would change about the show is like make it a children's show. Honestly, like a Harlem Globetrotter style cartoon. Even not even a car, you could do a variety a kids well, no, variety show. The thing show. about a cartoon is then you just have other people voice Pink Lady. Yeah, that's true. Like they did with the Harlem Globetrotters. It's a team of five guys all voiced by Scatman Crothers. <laughs> <laughs> just have Scatman play the <laughs> play the Pink Lady. Uh, this is an impression no one wants to do. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's hear Scatman <laughs> Crothers doing the Pink Lady. Come on. Wait a minute. Hang on. No, I'm thinking of Scatman. Yeah, Scatman is the sing- Scatman Crothers is not the singer uh, who sang Scatman in the 90s. Scatman Crothers, he's uh, in The Shining. Yeah, no, but I had to do an A to C. Okay, yeah. Uh, but I, could, I wasn't going to do. Uh, yeah, but I did enjoy their like opening number a lot. I was like, all right. Yeah. Flashy Power Rangers dancing. They also, there was a, there's like a music, there's a chorus. Mm-hmm. line that's like part of the show that they do just throw in because it feels like they have to they paid for them they're gonna use them <laughs> uh by the way yeah the second episode it was uh red buttons uh who's the musical guy Which, alice cooper? oh alice cooper from a weird time when alice cooper was ripping off gary newman yeah i who what did gary newman say cars okay er, oh yeah in cars but like also um yeah his work with two by army very good I'm, uh, gary newman's great but yeah he's yeah he's just directly ripping off doing like a weird 80s sound no it's very gary newman it's not like general 80s sound it is very specifically gary newman two by army sound okay like if you don't know you what sing, that is the song he sings is clones and Two Boy Army had an album that came out a year before called Replicas. <laughs> you know he was just listening to Replicas and being like, all right, what's a synonym? Clones, here we go. And it's the same song. That's so weird to just like, I guess also before it was much easier to be like a blatant ripoff. Yeah. So Gary Newman would have success with cars in America, but that would, I don't know if it would be a hit in 1980. I don't know if it was a hit by the time the show was on. Two Boy Army would have been popular in Europe, but not in America. So it's possible he's like, well, no one has heard this in America. Ah. He may have, yeah. And then it backfired on him. I mean, it was like cult popular in America at the time, but. Uh, they use, uh, they use computer dating. That's weird. That was, that was crazy in 1980. They're like, the new way everybody's dating is on the computer. Yeah. And it turned out what they were talking about was you send in a card to a computer and then the computer matches you up with your perfect match and uh jeff gets matched up with the robot from lost in space the danger will robinson <laughs> robot and uh match made in heaven yeah and then they well the robot specifically says to jeff i'm not easy yeah that's like that actually limits the comedic possibilities of this scene the funnier scene is if the robot is aggressively pursuing jeff and jeff is not into it yeah that is a much funnier version of the yeah. scene than the robot being like i'm a good girl robot yeah. what are you doing be a bad girl robot yeah make jeff uncomfortable <laughs> so people will remember who he is yeah. uh and then um yeah and i forget like the robot like jeff's in on it or like he's oh, into it. Uh, not at first. He comes around. Oh, he comes around. I remember. Him- I think he's trying to make the pink lady jealous. One of them. Both of them. You think he's trying to. He's into both of them. And that would be funny if on uh, Jeff's uh, Wikipedia, and he hooked up with both the pink ladies. <laughs> Thank he's you married very to much. both of them. <laughs> he's into both of them, and they're into him. Yeah. They left because they had to go back to their home planet of Japan. They rode on the back of the flying <laughs> robots all the way to Japan. Uh. I would watch that anime. Good news. Pink Lady has an anime that you can watch. I, w- I would watch the Pink Lady and Jeff anime. It's like a Kim Possible style show. I can see that. Yeah, that works. The Pink Ladies are spies. Japanese spies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Let's get them. Let's get them on the horn. Pink Lady. Hello. 
Hello? Oh, <laughs> shoot. I forgot they don't speak English. This is going to be tough to have a conversation with the pink lady. I feel like they probably speak English at this point now. Why? They wouldn't have had to learn. They're just huge in Japan. It's been 40 years. They, I'm just saying they're dealing with I a lot of... I know plenty of 40-year-olds that never learned J- Japanese. Just because it's been 40 years doesn't mean they learned Japanese or English. Yeah, you're right. They may have, though. They might have. They might have. I feel like it would, like after this, I would, I would, if I had the stress from this, I would either, actually, I would either choose to never learn Japanese or learn it like the next day. It would be like, be like I'm never letting that happen to me again. Yeah. Anyway, these sketches in this episode. Yeah. Um, oh, t- uh, yeah. Art Nouveau comes back. Yep. And an elephant poops during his. And they clearly didn't expect the elephant to poop during the sketch. Oh, yeah. And he has to improv that the, because the elephant is pooping. He's not great at it. No. His improv is literally just, don't look over there. And he repeats that for about five minutes. He's like, well, uh, that is a natural thing that elephants do naturally, I guess. And it's fine. And it's not a big deal, actually, in fact. And that's like most of what that sketch. And then they, they're, yeah, they're just hiding away from the elephant pooping instead yep. of. Uh, yeah, because he's not keeping it together. Jeff is not keeping it together at all. Yeah. He's just like. Mm, mm, mm. There's an, another Carson sketch. Yep. This time they're looking for Johnny Carson's replacement. It's like a competition. Yeah. And they've gotten down to their last two people. And Jim Varney's introing it. Yeah. And uh, the last two people are both crazy. And one of them is is Jeff. And Jeff is playing, you know, very much like a Jim Carrey in Dumb and Dumber. Is how yeah. I would describe the character he's playing. Yeah, I would say that's but with less optimism. Yeah. But then as soon as he so his character ends up winning. Yeah, and the other woman does a good job. She does she's fine. fine. She's yeah. like a Valley Girl character, kind of. Yeah. And then that's what I mean. She's doing an okay job and he wins. And then as soon as he wins, he stops being the dumb and dumber type character and he starts doing his Carson impression again. But and I think this is kind of the point uh this speaks to the point that it doesn't really transition very well. Yeah. Is cuz like he switched to Carson and I didn't know. <laughs> I I noticed. I, I know, like I noticed he changed, but I didn't realize that he was going to just be in Carson at that point because yep. it wasn't it wasn't enough of a change. Yeah, they really de-emphasize the Pink Lady in this episode as well. Yeah, she they just sing. That's yep. really mostly what they're doing. They're not really in any sketches. They're just singing, which is great. Good for them. They get to just kind of kind of do interludes. Yeah, uh, Jerry Lewis, uh, very fun in this. So, yeah, well, first Red Buttons shows up. Oh, yeah, Red Buttons. Red Buttons uh, shows up in a sketch where he's a patient at a, a hospital. And they refuse to give him any anesthesia. Right. You know that Cause funny it, idea. Because it costs more to get anesthesia. Yeah. Uh, hospitals are a pain. They're very expensive. And then he's getting, like, you know, sawed open and stuff yeah. and screaming. And then it's like, does it hurt? He's like, does it cost more to hurt? No, well, actually, the start of that sketch is this is a sketch that the pink lady is actually in. Yeah. They are playing red buttons as like nieces. Yeah. Which, and that's why they're know, not. He, I'd like to know red buttons is white and they are Japanese. Honestly, I get red buttons and red fox confused all the time. Very different. Very different. And I was so disappointed when red buttons showed up. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, but, oh, we had Sherman Hemsley the first episode. I was like, we're going to get red fox. There's yeah. rules. And then Red Buttons does like a vaudeville thing with them where he tries to help them figure out their catchphrase. Oh, yeah. But they've already been doing this catchphrase the whole time. They do it a bunch in the first episode. And their catchphrase is just them going, yes, no. <laughs> Great catchphrase. Also, yeah, Red Buttons had a catchphrase that I did. It was like yeah. a little dance he did. Yeah, I think I don't think you should be able to dance as your catchphrase. He's like, you got to have your signature thing. And when people see this, they know it's Red Buttons. And I was just like, oh, this feels old even for this. Yeah, man. I, I want people to know that like if you're trying to get like the youth excited at this show, they could turn on MTV instead at this time. <laughs> they could go watch the music video for once in a lifetime by talking heads. Genuine weird experimental style stuff. And you've got red buttons. Going, you gotta give them a little a, soft shit. Hundred and fifty year old man talking to two Japanese women that don't understand him. Developing their great catchphrase of yes, no. Yep. Oh boy, you want to watch that, kids? You into that, the youth? Uh, then Jerry Lewis is honestly doing great. Yeah, Jerry Lewis is clearly 
better than everyone on the show. He's just a cut above. There's a le- it's kind of like when football players are all around each other, they look the same size. Yeah. But then you see them next to anybody else, you're like, oh, they're a monster and massive. And I think that's what happens with Jerry Lewis. He's he's giving every ounce of energy he has to this show. And it's funny because he seems pissed that he has to. Because it's still not working because the crowd is dead because they've witnessed 25 minutes of Pink Lady and Jeff beforehand. They're bored. And Jerry Lewis is leaving it all out there to get like decent response. Yeah, he's killing it. He's yeah. like he is doing the he's doing a much better version of the no one's ever heard of you bit. Oh, he is so mean to Jeff. It's so funny. I think those were all his jokes and he actually didn't like Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Altman. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Altman. But then they cut away to a sketch that Jerry wrote himself and it is weirdly experimental. It is so it's conceptual. It's incredibly meta. It goes about three layers deep within realities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it it's yeah, do you want to explain cuz he sings like a little bit of a song and then he goes that was a short song. Let me explain what happened. And then they cut to a sketch of him rehearsing it. Yeah. And then within that he's acknowledging that the crew is doing a bad job in stopping him. But then the crew seems to like revolt against him. And the cameras start getting up way too close to him. Yeah, and this is like a six-minute But then we have a perspective from a different camera watching as the cameras move into him. So we've we've stopped seeing the perspective of the cameras that normally film the show. And we're now outside observers of how the production of Pink Lady and Jeff happens and how it annoys Jerry Lewis. To the point where he then stands on a camera. Yeah. And like lifts up into the air and is just going around with the camera in the air. Yeah. And it's it's pretty good. I'm enjoying like out of everything in this show, it's like, oh, this stands out and is a very weird thing. Yeah. Do you think they were just gonna have him sing like a shitty song and he went, No, we're doing wild. Honestly, probably. Cause he's literally he's listed as a writer for special materials. Yeah. They might have tried to put him in red buttons as sketch. And he was like, I'm not doing that. Oh, the the the, the hospital one? Yeah. Cause that one requires a lot of big reactions that he probably would have nailed. But he's like, no, we're not this doing. This sucks. You would be like, yeah, this sucks. Like that is one of those things. Like I mostly know, like I don't know Jerry Lewis, his work. You know, it's like I know of it and I've seen little bits of it, but I'm not watching. You know, a lot of Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Uh, although I did have a really dumb joke I would do. Uh, this is an impression of uh, uh, Ca- uh, Cameron Lee Lewis Espos- Lou Esposito. Let's hear it. I'm a lady that dates ladies. Yeah, I can see why you don't normally do that. There's not really a huge <laughs> audience for it. For my Cameron Esposito, Jerry Lewis, it fashion match up. Uh, there's very few people that are going to like that. <laughs> Cameron Lee, Lou Esposito. <laughs> They're all in Brooklyn, though. I yeah. should be trying it there. <laughs> um. Uh, it's weird he didn't try to hide this like the clown holocaust movie <laughs> that's the thing so that's what i was trying to say is like i like i have so much more respect for him seeing this guy like i'm like oh his comedic sensibility is like really good yeah the reason he was a star for a long time i know but it's but you sometimes you watch those like comedy ages like milk oh yeah like a lot of the jokes i don't find funny but i recognize the talent yeah that's fair yeah uh, and he's but he's having so he is it, not having fun, but he is making the most of it mm-hmm. is the best way I can describe it. Just be like Jeff Altman and Jeff clearly loves Jerry. Yeah, he's so excited when he's there. And then Jerry hates Jeff. He's just he's so mean to him. to him hard because he also can't make fun of the pink ladies. They're not going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even really know who he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, they know who he is. I'm sure no. he was huge. Yeah. <laughs> Laughing Rowan and Martin. I don't think he was, was he on laugh? No, no, no. He was in, uh, no, what is it? Uh, no, Dean Martin and Lewis were, they had their own Different things. Martin. Who am I thinking of? Oh, yeah, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, but he's not the Martin oh, from Rowan I'm, and Martin. you're right. Rowan and Martin, it's what some of the writers wrote for. Yeah. That's what I was getting. But, um, <laughs> yeah, the rest of the episode is just like boring sketches. Yeah, really. That are occasionally elevated by Jim Varney being pretty good. Yeah, Jim Varney is solid. Jerry Lee Lewis not Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lewis. No, no one marries their fifteen-year-old cousin in this show. Oh, uh, I um, kept saying that's why I was. That's why it wasn't working. It's Cameron Lou Esposito. Yeah. Um, I thought you were. I thought that's how you were just 
forcing Jerry in there for some reason. No, I, I just I added Lee because I got Jerry Lewis and Jerry Lee Lewis stuck in my different head. people. Sorry, goodness gracious. Um, but yeah, then a bunch of boring sketches, and then it ends with a little inversion of the hot tub ending, where like we're not going into the hot tub. There's been a shark spotted. Well, no, Jeff is already in the hot. Jeff's tub. already in the hot tub. I'm like, there's been took sharks. Off his suit. And Jeff's like, you're crazy. There's no sharks. And then a shark fin pops up with a legally distinct, not theme from Jaws playing. <laughs> Sounds very close to it, but it's not the theme. But uh, <laughs> da ba. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, tar- and Jeff Jeff runs out screaming. Yep. And then it turns out it was just their body bodyguardo with a fin on his head. Ready to fucking protect them at all costs. And then they freeze frame on the bodyguard with the fin on his head. Credits roll. <laughs> it rules. It kind of is funny, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's definitely like an editor being like, can we just end it here? Yeah, yeah I think so. Anyway. Uh, so That's Pink Lady and Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I think I'd improve the show by i i make it a children's show i think that's really you make it a kid's show then the jokes don't have to be that good you can have like also you had children's writers a children's tv producer yeah trying to make a weird show like this would be a difficult show to do with a, a, like a seasoned team and now you're just using a bunch of people who mostly write for like hr puff and stuff and stuff yeah uh and then as far as a show I'd recommend, uh, I'll do a, the Larry Sanders show. That's a great... There you go. Behind the scenes TV show. Yeah. Um, I would say that they need to switch towards physical comedy. Yeah. You can have a more international appeal with it. It's an easy way to fix it. Because that said, good, doing good physical comedy is very hard to write. Um, otherwise, everybody would do it. But maybe you can pull it off. Well, and also you have like Jim Varney on your staff. And, exactly, and yeah. That- the the, the Jim, also yeah jim should be the host instead of jeff pink lady and jim pink lady and jam yeah oh uh, let's just do pink lady and ernest <laughs> ernest goes to japan <laughs> yeah. well earl shit what's it Vern, no, no, Vern. What I, know what i mean pink lady know what i mean pink lady <laughs> Vern, we're going to japan oh no Oh man, that would be a very racist yeah, movie. Yeah, it would. It would. I'm just picturing it now. Like he went to Africa. It wasn't great. Yeah, I, I've never seen Ernest goes to Africa, but that's what I was. Gonna yeah. <laughs> he would be fighting samurai for most of that movie. If it was around now, it would be Ernest gets canceled. <laughs> <laughs> like Ernest would have had to switch to being on the Daily Wire by now if Jim Varney was still alive. <laughs> You know what I mean, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> Facts don't care about your feelings. Burn. <laughs> uh, oh. yeah. It's actually, it's funny though, because Jim Vardy, by all accounts, seems like very yeah, nice yeah. and sweet. Yeah. And like, I would have just watching him just slowly turn into like an alt-right Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a show, probably The Muppet Show. Yeah, that's a great. It's a variety show that is uh, coherent. I would have loved the pig ladies on the Muppet Show. Yeah, they've been great. Yeah, doing their little song and dance. Well, they were never popular enough. Hence the problem with this show. No, it. No one knows who Pink Lady is or Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Altman. The Jeff Altman. <laughs>